Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. My talk is about fine-tuning embryo setting to improve our result with CRISPR in livestock, in sheep in particular. And uh, I live in Uruguay. I have my, my lab in Uruguay. And here we produce a lot of sheep and, and cattle uh, for export. Most of the, our, our meats, milk, and wool is exported to different countries. And so, for this reason, these new technologies like CRISPR are very important for us to, to improve the technologies, to validate the technologies, to know the technologies in the field. And for this reason, we worked with CRISPR from some years ago, uh, from 2013, 2014, we are working in different projects with CRISPR in sheep. Our first project, was with myostatin, was published in 2015, and this was one of the first reports with um, CRISPR in livestock. In this case, we use uh, myostatin knockout uh, chip working with super fine merino sheep. You know that Australian merino sheep, super fine. Merino sheep is one of the most famous sheep around the world because it's the best breed to produce wool. And the problem with this breed is that the lambs are very small and very, very thin. And this is a problem for farmers or for the producer because the, the, the lambs are, are, are small because meat production is very, very low. On the other hand, meat breeds like Texel are very specialized in meat production. And Texel in particular has a, a myostatin knockout a mutation, a spontaneous mutation in, in, in his genome. And the, the wool is very poor and was not possible to combine wool production and meat production in a uh, only one breed. So we try with uh, myostatin, myostatin mutation into the genome of Merino. And in this case, we work with, with embryo from Merino and we introduce the CRISPR with this mutation and we produce 22 lambs. 10 of them were, were a knockout and the knockout lamb were heavier than the wild type lambs. In this case, we, you, you know, you, you see a wild type lamb compared with a knockout lamb. The body weight was very different, eight kilograms versus 11 kilograms, about 25% uh, heavier than wild type merino lamb. This is a typical merino lamb. And these 10 animals were heavier than these 12 uh, wild type lambs. This was one of the first uh, reports with the use of, of CRISPR in, in livestock. Um, when we compare the wool production one year later, the wool production was not affected by the CRISPR, so wild type and knockout lambs have very similar will quality and so this sheep were with more meat production and with wool production similar than merino so we proved that with this technology with crispr was possible to produce more wool more meat in the same animal in very few months we obtained a breed or a kind of animal that was not possible with classical genetics during thousands of years. From domestication, I think that human child to produce an animal with a lot of uh, meat and very high quality wool and was not possible. And CRISPR, yes, is, is the technology that produced this kind of animal in very few months um, easier. In other projects, 
like we performed two years ago, I work with this other model to produce this chip in a human disease model. Uh, in, in human is a, a very common disease or very common uh, disorder produced by a mutation in autoferlin. Uh, we produce the same mutation in sheep in collaboration with a company from USA, from United States, to evaluate different therapies in, in sheep for this human disorder. In this case, we produce 13 lambs, deaf lambs, and in this case, you have a wild type lamb and a deaf lamb. So this is with CRISPR was very effective in, in this, in this uh, project. And in this case, we, we produce, we tamper, we tamper uh, more than 1,300 embryos in 250 recipients. And we produce about 70 lambs. And some of them were mutants and most of, of the mutants were knocking for this gene that we introduce with the mutation, the same mutation that the human have. So uh, the information is published here, so you can see the, the details in, in this report. But I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, talk about our scoring goal. I prefer to, in this talk, to talk about the, the missed goals, the files, in the technology, the limiting factor that we have. Uh, and, and the journey from CRISPR design to achieve the desired animals does, don't always imply an easy, fast, and guaranteed success. When applied in large animals, CRISPR involves long time and high cost consuming projects. And it is mandatory not only to choose the best approach for genome editing, but also for embryo production, site of microinjection, for cryopreservation, because cryopreservation also is possible after CRISPR injection. And also, we need uh, an efficient embryo transfer technique for achieve the success. So, uh, in this case, I prefer to talk about these related technologies uh, to CRISPR because. We need molecular biology, and also we need embryo-related technologies work together in collaboration, because if not, success is not possible. Usually, we talk about the CRISPR system, and usually also we talk about the application of CRISPR in livestock. Very interesting, but usually we don't talk about the other related technologies. We need to produce the zygote and we need to micro manipulate the zygote. We need to inject the, the CRISPR into the system and we need to embryo transfer or vitrification. So, in this talk, I prefer to talk about that. We, we have two ways to produce the, the zygotes. In vivo produce it or in vitro produce it. For uh, in vivo derived zygote, we, we need to collect the zygote from the oviduct by oviduct flashing. And for in vitro producer zygote, we produce the embryos in the lab after oocyte recovery from, from the follicles. When we work with uh, live females for in vivo derived zygote, we need uh, estrosynchronization of the donor, superovulation, mating or artificial insemination, surgical oviduct flashing, but we obtain variable ovulation rate, variable fertilization rate, variable timing from ovulation to fertilization, and this produce variable embryo stage at time 
of microinjection. And this is a problem for microinjection and for the, the success of the technology. And usually, surgery limits the, to repeat the procedure in the same female because adhesion and animal welfare concerns might limit the number of laparotomies. On the other hand, in vitro produced zygotes, uh, I think that is more efficient and we prefer this technology because uh, before 2000, for in the time that we work with transgenesis, in that time, the technology that was available was in vivo derived zygotes. But nowadays, with the, develop, the development of the in vitro technology, it is, was possible to work in the lab. And so it's very easy to work in the lab with the embryos and it's not depending on the uh, live animal, live donors producing, producing the cycle. So in this case, we need follicular aspiration by laparoscopy and more cycles are produced per female. We have better control of the stage of the embryo for microinjection, is less traumatic or less invasive of the females, and follicular aspiration can be repeated in the same female every two weeks. So I think that this technique is much better than the other, and for this reason, we prefer and we promote in vitro producing zygote for people that work with CRISPR. Of course, in this case, when we collect oocytes from live animals, we need laparoscopic ovum pickup. This is not a complex technique, but of course we, we, we need some skills uh, and training, but the, the technology is easier and works. When we work with in vitro embryo production, so we can produce the, the embryos from live animals, by laparoscopic ovum pickup, or we can collect the oocyte in the avatar. I think that this is much better uh, for research projects and is really easier. And we obtain more quantity of oocyte from the avatar. It's very low cost uh, method. It's easier. And of course, depending on the distances to the avatar or, or the female availability, or, and, and sometimes has some sanitary risks in industrial or commercial operation. But for research project, is, this is not a very big problem, and we have a lot of uh, pros, a lot of advantage with the use of uh, this method to produce a lot of oocyte and a lot of zygote for microinjection. We prefer this this method and we promote this method and of course we need of in vitro maturation, in vitro fertilization and after that we proceed with a microinjection uh, and all of this protocol and this procedure that we use in our laboratory is available in this open as in journal you can access to these protocols and this procedure that we uh, use for in vitro maturation, in vitro fertilization, microinjection, and in vitro culture of the embryos. After in vitro fertilization, 18 hours after ABF, we proceed with the um, uh, microinjection into the cytoplasm. It's very fast and very quick uh, technique. Uh, is, is injected into the cytoplasm. Very simple and fast. For after so after after a cycle of microinjection, we proceed with cryopreservation or, or transfer the embryos fresh. Also, we use electroporation for, for delivery of the CRISPR system. But if, if I need to, I want to, to recommend some technology, some technique, I prefer to recommend microinjection because electroporation, today we are working in some projects and in some studies 
uh, but uh, in some cases it's not working at the same uh, at the same level that microinjection. So I think that electroporation is, is being uh, developing now, but uh, at this time I prefer zygote microinjection. After CRISPR, just freeze embryos will be transferred. In this case, I think that cryopreservation is very, very interesting thing because if we limit the transfer only to fresh embryo in large scale projects, it's very difficult to have, to have the, the donors, the microinjection in the same week, at the same time, and the embryo transfer with synchronization of the recipient. So it's very difficult to work all together at the same time. And so CRISPR, that is an easy technology, uh, become a very complex and difficult uh, task because we have a lot of work all together in the same week. So when we work in large scale program during some months, several weeks, we prefer to work with cryo embryo cryopreservation. So we work with the, with the uh, embryo production and CRISPR microinjection, and after that we vitrify the embryos for further embryo transfer some weeks or some months later. The protocol that we developed for vitrification is a, a new method with minimum volumen and this is possible to, to obtain acceptable pregnancy rate after in vitro embryo production, after microinjection with CRISPR, and so the embryos are su subjected to vitrification and acceptable pregnancy rate is obtained after the, all of this process. The information is published here, also is available for people that want to work with, with vitrification, with with this project in, with CRISPR. And after we have the embryos, the question is where are the embryos placed? Because usually people prefer transfer the embryos soon after a microinjection. And the other thing, the other alternative is transfer the embryos six days after ADF, six five days after microinjection into the uterine horn in blastocyst stage. So people that work and transfer the embryos soon after microinjection prefer to transfer the embryos into the uviduct and avoid the embryo death during in vitro culture. In our experience, we prefer to maintain the embryos into the lab during six days, and then we transfer only the embryos that survival to culture. And in this case, pregnancy rate is greater than when we, we transfer the embryos into the ovidu, because here a lot of embryos uh, will die, and so uh, pregnancy rate is, is lower. But of course, we need a in vitro culture system available and efficient, and so this may be a limiting factor. For this reason, I recommend to improve your system for in vitro culture, and so to choose the embryos, the, the survival embryos to be transferred in blastocyst stage into the uh, uterine horn, that, it, that it's much easier to transfer into the oviducts. When we transfer the embryos in early stage, on day two after ADF, using fresh embryo because uh, early stage embryo uh, cure tolerance is very low with early stage embryo, and pregnancy rate was 24%. Also, may be transferred into the uterine horn instead of the oviduct, and in this case, with early stage embryos transferred into the uterine horn, pregnancy rate is acceptable. So I think that this is other alternative. If you want to transfer early stage embryos soon after microinjection, you can transfer the embryos into the uterine horn 
instead of the oviduct. And this is much easier, is less invasive for the, for the, for the recipient. And pregnancy rate is a little similar or, or higher than the transferring into the oviduct. On the other hand, when we use late stage embryos, six days after AVF, with fresh embryo, we obtain a very, very acceptable pregnancy rate. And also with vitrified embryos in blastocyst stage, pregnancy rate is also high, acceptable at least. So I recommend in our project we use today, all the embryos are vitrified in blastocyst stage and then are transferred into the uterine home. So to finish, during this year, we worked with more than 2,000 embryos in, in different projects. More than 100 lambs were produced and about 50, 50 lambs were edited by CRISPR in, in, in our laboratory. And as conclusion, we recommend work with in vitro produced zygote with cytoplasmic injection of CRISPR. We use vitrification of all the embryos and we transfer the embryos in light stage, at blastocyst stage, into the uterine horn. If you prefer to, to transfer early embryos, only fresh, because vitrification is not working very well with early stage embryos, and you can transfer the embryos into the uterine horn instead of the oviduct. That is easier, is faster, and less invasive for the recipient. Thank you for your attention. If you want some question, I'm available.